Hello, in this video, T-Cube National Instructor Jeff Lukens and myself, Dana Morse, will be presenting Zombie Apocalypse and Body of Evidence, a look at Texas Instruments' STEM Behind Hollywood series. My name is Dana Morse, and I have the pleasure of introducing T-Cube National Instructor Jeff Lukens tonight because we are presenting Zombie Apocalypse and Body of Evidence, a look at Texas Instruments STEM Behind Hollywood series. The agenda for this webinar is first, we have to say hello, introductions, things like that, but resources for educators and students. And I already heard it when we were talking before, we love free stuff. So I'm going to start with smiles and want people to pay attention later on because you can get what we're going to show for free. We're going to then transition to the actual presentation. Jeff has recorded both the uh, lessons for tonight. And then we'll come back, remind people of the fantastic resources, and finish with a little Q&A. So, huh, teachers have lots of problems, this year especially. Texas Instruments has lots of solutions. First things first, teachers need the software. What Jeff's going to be presenting tonight is all from the software point of view. Virtual classrooms, if teachers email me, and there's my email right there, dmorse at ti.com, d for Dana, Morse like my last name, at ti.com, ti Smart View for the 84 Plus, ti Inspire CX Premium Teacher Software, and if we do have some middle school teachers who are you know, following along and they need a scientific emulator just to get through this virtual learning, contact me. I'm happy to share. TI does not want to profit off of a pandemic. So TI has made their TI84 Plus beta app for Chromebooks. So any school, any user that can access a Chromebook, TI is making that app free through July 15th, 2021. Again, Contact me and I will assist. For schools that don't have Chromebooks, but they have a Windows or Mac solution, the educational dealers made a 365-day subscription for students, and it costs as low as $13 to get access to the software. And you can just go to education.ti.com forward slash dealers for more information on that. YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and search Mr. Dana Morse, this is what I've been doing since COVID broke out. I'm not going to schools anymore, so now I am showing all the tips and tricks that uh, I can do, and this video will be posted to YouTube later. Jeff, would you like to uh, do a little introduction? Well, thanks, Dana, and it's really good to be with all of you. I'm still trying to figure out where everybody is sitting, other than in libraries and living rooms and whatnot, but geographically, but uh, we can get to that later. I'm Jeff Lukens, and as Dana said, I'm what's formally at this point known as a TQ, which stands for Teachers Teaching with Technology uh, National Instructor, and I've uh, actually been with TI since probably about the mid-90s. I've been doing work with teachers, typically in their schools or in a common site, and we do PD, which isn't really happening too much anymore in a common site because everybody's in their own site. But uh, I was a high school biology teacher for 35 years in public school and uh, retired in 2013. And since that time in 2013, I've been doing uh, TI stuff pretty much full time. I mean, I, that's I say that tongue in cheek because full time is really relative anymore. But um, what my what my world now involves is going into schools and working with teachers and students on implementing TI technology in their classrooms. Um, also, have had the opportunity to do some authoring of some activities like the two tonight. You're going to see. Um, all of the really boring stuff I authored, all the really cool stuff somebody else did because they have way better coding skills than I do, which is pretty much not much at all. But, um, you know, my big push in my teaching life was that, I don't know if that looks backwards, but it looks like Mets, which is a losing baseball team, or it looks like STEM, 
which is integrating science and math. And I know we talk about STEM, STEAM, and several other iterations of that. But um, to me, we don't teach science or math, we teach students. And if we're gonna be teaching the same students, we should be thinking about how to best make both of those subject areas uh, valuable for them and make them good learning environments for them. So I won't go into my STEM speech right now, but what Dana mentioned to you was, you're gonna see two activities tonight that start with that, work, with that acronym, STEM behind. And the whole purpose of this series of activities was to bring math and science together using some really cool uh, hip sort of uh, pop culture kind of, of topics. And I think you'll see that tonight. So Dana, I don't know anything else you want me to talk about or, or am I good? Hello, my name is Dana Morse and I'm an educational technology consultant for Texas Instruments. I cover New York and Pennsylvania, working closely with schools on how to integrate TI classroom solutions. I'm excited to share with you the following presentation from one of our T-Cube instructors. Please contact me for any TI technology needs. Today's presenter will give you some insight on how TI technology can work for your science and STEM students. Hello everybody, my name is Jeff Lukens and I'm coming to you from Sioux Falls, South Dakota where I was a high school biology teacher for about 35 years in a public school here in Sioux Falls and after the 2012-13 school year I retired and since that time I've been um, doing anything but lounging around and doing the retirement thing. I've been working with teachers in their classrooms and doing conferences and so on, uh, helping them learn how to use Texas Instruments technology. And uh, some of the technology that we're going to be using today is part of that, uh, those trainings that I do with teachers. And we're gonna gear, be gearing our uh, time together today around a device and around a piece of software that work with what's called TI Inspire, which is a graphing calculator uh, with a whole bunch of really fancy stuff that it can do and, and a lot of curriculum materials and so on that can be used on the graphing calculator. One of those pieces of curriculum material is uh, something little did we know how timely this would be uh, a few years after this activity was created for, uh, for high school science classes. And this is Zombie Apocalypse. It's from a, an umbrella of activities that are found free on TI's website. And this umbrella of activities is called STEM Behind Hollywood. And uh, the zombie activity was the first activity under this umbrella of STEM Behind Hollywood. And it has become a very, very uh, popular activity. And I think you'll see why. Kids love it, teachers love it. When we present this at conference sessions, the participants just eat it up. They think it's no pun intended, eat it up, zombies, you know. As I mentioned, this is one of several activities under the STEM Behind Hollywood umbrella. So here's our first page of the activity. Uh, we have a title page here, and it talks about how disease spreads through a population. And I think right now you're probably going, hmm, that sounds sort of familiar with a situation that happened starting in about February or March in the United States and worldwide. So this is, a, as I mentioned, a really timely activity. But this first page is a real attention getter for kids. You have this guy who is clearly, it looks like three people, but this is supposed to represent a person who is turning into a zombie. And he goes from a fairly normal guy holding his stomach to one that's a raging zombie looking for somebody's brains to eat. Now, so let's take a look at the next page. And I'm just clicking, I'm just moving my mouse to the top of the screen here and just clicking on these little tabs, just similar to a PowerPoint presentation, but clicking on these tabs and um, moving from one page to the next. One thing I always do with students and with, with adults is say, are there any words on this page that you think students may not know or they may not be that familiar with? They may have heard of them, but they may not be that familiar with them. And most people on this page pick out that word right there. Now, uh, many months ago, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started, this was a, an even more foreign word to people. But now, 
we hear about epidemiologists all the time. I mean, it's sort of backed off a little bit, but we still are hearing about epidemiologists. So when the students say, yeah, that's a word right there I'm not that familiar with, what a great opportunity as a teacher to say, huh, let's talk about a little bit of vocabulary here and talk about a potential, not just vocabulary word, but a possible career choice for people. I know when I was a kid, which was a long time ago, when I was a kid, I never had anybody I knew said, oh yeah, I wanna be an epidemiologist when I grow up. Well, nowadays, uh, because of the infectious disease piece of, of the realities of our society, epidemiology is a pretty big deal. And uh, it's an opportunity for kids to say, oh wow, I didn't know that actually was a career opportunity for me there. So here we have uh, this word, epidemiology. And uh, some other things to point out here, we have a virus, okay? We're gonna call this zombie, the, the pathogen, if you will, that causes zombieism. We're gonna just say it's a virus, okay? And it's discovered in the brains of humans and it turns them into zombies. So we got this epide these epidemiologists who are trying to figure out what to do about this, how to diagnose it, how to prevent it, how to cure it, whatever that the case may be. But here's some other, really amazing things that we wanted to make sure we built into this. And even though zombies aren't real, and even though this is a made up scenario, we tried to put in some realistic uh, metaphors, if you will. For example, this one right here. The virus is an airborne virus. In other words, it spreads through the air from a an infected person to a non-infected person, transported in saliva droplets of an infected individual. So saliva droplets are uh, spewed out when somebody sneezes or coughs, or even if they talk, there's some, some words that people can say and some sounds that could cause uh, saliva to be put into the air around the person that is doing the talking or sneezing or coughing. Now, one thing to bring up here with students is, hey, are there any real human diseases that are transported in this way or transmitted in this way, airborne. And I would argue that the two most common diseases in any school are transmitted this way. And those would be influenza, which is transmitted like this, and also the cold virus or rhinovirus, which is transmitted through the air as well. So we have some reality here, uh, even though we're talking again about this made up scenario of zombieism. Let's go to the next page on page 1.3. So these four parts of the brain, we're going to say that these are the parts that are affected by the zombie virus. And I would guess that most people, uh, even most young biology students, or even in eighth grade or, or seventh grade when they take life science, have probably heard of one or two of these four parts of the brain, the cerebellum, uh, is certainly a part that most of them have heard of. The cerebrum is probably the part that they've heard of the most, and they don't see that on here anyway. There, anywhere, there's no cerebrum listed, but the frontal lobe, this one in green, is actually a part of the cerebrum. The other two parts that we're going to say are impacted are the hypothalamus, which is the part of your brain. It's really, it's embedded very deep, right in the middle of the brain. And one of the things the hypothalamus does, and the hypothalamus does a whole bunch of stuff, but one of the things it does is it is the center for appetite control. So, uh, I mean, if you have like a really, really crazy big appetite, maybe you can, you know, blame the hypothalamus for that. I don't know. But in a zombie, zombies never seem to be satisfied with how much they've eaten. They just are always hungry. So the hypothalamus is messed up by this virus. The other one that's kind of a fun word to say is the amygdala. And that's uh, actually right next door to the hypothalamus in the middle of the brain. And zomb one of the zombie's characteristics and distinguishing characteristics is they're not very happy. I was going to call them people, but they're not very happy beings. They're they're ticked off. They're they're angry. They're they're mad. They're always on the hunt for to kill people or eat people or whatever. And the amygdala is that part of the brain. Sometimes the amygdala is called the crocodile brain because in a in a reptile, like a crocodile, the amygdala is actually quite large in comparison to the rest of the brain. So, um, you know, I, I guess that has something to do with them sort of always being mad or ticked off or 
whatever the uh, reptiles it is. So here's our four parts of the brain that we're going to be saying are impacted by this zombie virus. And here's where they are located. And they, if you'll notice, this is a very subtle thing, but it's a big deal. These parts of the brain are color coded. Color is a great learning motivator. And all of these four parts of the brain are color coded. And we were sneaky and said, okay, the frontal lobe, we're gonna make that phrase in green. And so we're gonna make the frontal lobe green and the cerebellum is gonna be blue and so on. And there we have them. And the hypothalamus and the amygdala are buried right in the middle of the brain, not too far anterior to the brain stem, which is right here. So there's the location, little little anatomy here. Not a lot of physiology here. Physiology is what things do, what parts of the body do. Anatomy is where they're located. So here's the anatomy of those four parts of the brain. If this, if this particular part of the brain were impacted by this virus, what would be the outcome? Okay, what would be the result of that? So the cerebellum, zombies kind of clumsily shuffle along and we, so, uh, but the classic zombie symptom is kind of just shuffling forward. And that would be a, the result of a, a malfunctioning, if you will, of the cerebellum. Hypothalamus, they have insatiable appetites is another word, another vocabulary word that some students may not know. Good opportunity to bring that up. Frontal lobe, amygdala, and so on. Now, wh what are some human conditions that actually do occur? where somebody, for example, clumsily shuffles forward or loses muscle control. And with the cerebellum, um, with muscle control being its main function, we could talk about all of the, the series of what are called neuromuscular diseases like ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, muscular dystrophy, MS, uh, and so on. There's a lot of these, these neuro, which means nerve, muscular, which obviously means muscular, so a nervous system, muscular system malfunction. And actually the malfunction in all of those neuromuscular diseases, in, in most of them, actually happens in the nervous system, but the resulting uh, display of that uh, nervous system malfunction is in the muscular system. So it's a great opportunity to have kids do some research, like what are some diseases, some human diseases, that actually manifest themselves with these symptoms. Uh, poor problem solvers, you know, we, we could argue that we know people like that. I know people have accused me of that before. And then this amygdala, the zombies just aren't nice. They're full of rage. And, and uh, a lot of times if you teach in high school, uh, athletes have heard of one of the side effects of steroids, of anabolic steroids that are taken by uh, an athlete. Uh, is that they've heard of roid rage or something like that. So you'll, you'll have them actually talk about things like that, which is kind of a cool deal when they start to see some of these familiar uh, conditions, but playing out in zombies, okay? So that's pretty cool. All right, so let's get on to page 1.6. Here it is. Here's our, our guy who is a fairly normal looking guy. And Here's the brain of this person, presumably. And so I'm gonna go ahead and click on this play button, which is right down here. One of the things about TI Inspire, not only the software that I'm using on my computer, but also the handheld, the TI Inspire graphing calculator. This looks exactly the same on that calculator. So the next thing you're gonna see me do is something that you may not have ever seen a graphing calculator do before, which is a simulation, an actual movement of something. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on play and I'm just gonna let this run through a couple of times and we'll see what happens to this guy as he goes from stage zero. So here he is, he's a human with no infection and now we're going to go ahead and infect him. And I'm just letting this run through. I'm not clicking on anything right now. This is a loop that runs through continuously and it will run continuously until we stop it. <coughs> so you can see this guy as the stages progress from stage zero to stage four, clearly he's changing on the left side. His face is changing, he's getting these lesions all over him, he's getting ticked off and looks like he's full of rage. 
Meanwhile, on the right side, we see the result of the virus or the impact the virus is having on his brain. Here's his frontal lobe and the cerebellum that are shrinking up, which is uh, the fancy word for that is atrophy or can be atrophy. Meanwhile, the amygdala and the hypothalamus in the middle of the brain are getting red and infected. Okay, now we can actually step through this um, one stage at a time. So I'm gonna pause it after stage one and you can talk about that with the students and just take a look at uh, what, what changes have occurred in this guy from stage zero to stage one. There's stage two, we see him looking a little bit different. I'm just clicking play and then pause again. Here he's starting to look a little scarier. And then finally, when we get to stage four, he looks beyond scary. He looks like he's a full-fledged, full-blown zombie. Okay, so that's a, you know, if the kid, if you didn't have their attention before, you certainly have their attention now. This is a really, really cool deal for keeping kids on task and keeping kids' attention. All right, so let's take a look here at uh, the next page. We just watched the guy turn into a zombie. From here on, you're going to be able to relate to the middle part of the year 2020. So as with all infectious diseases, we always assume that the, the virus started with one person, or the, the disease, if you will, had to start somewhere. And so the background of this is we're going to say one person was the initial zombie if impacted by the zombie virus. And that person, because of the contagious nature of this virus, has the opportunity to infect other people. So we're just going to make some, you know, made up rules, basically. It's estimated that each zombie then infects an average of two people per week. Okay, so we just arbitrarily made that up. And the number of, another made up word, zombified, the number of people who are zombified grows and grows and grows. So we're going to take a look at the graph. Now, here's what kids do. They'll look at the bottom of that, that uh, page and they'll go, wow, I want to go look at that graph and see how scary it is. And at first, so I'll move ahead to page 1.8. At first, it's like, oh, yeah, that's really scary. They, they're not frightened by that graph because it is a picture of data that hasn't been analyzed yet. But as they take a look at this graph, and as the teacher, that's you, as the teacher talks about this and what it means, then this graph sort of becomes, uh, they kind of catch their breath a little bit. Because not only does this work in the made up case of zombies, but we have seen this happening in the last many months in the US and also in the world with COVID. So when you could bring up things that, that prior to COVID, we never really had heard this phrase, flatten the curve. And you can spend some time talking to the students about what that means in context of the spread of a disease. Here, right now, this looks like it's an out of control exponential growth, if you will. But flatten the curve means get this growth, get this rate of infection to slow down so that there's not as many people who are infected. And, and all these, these precautions were taken with COVID that were designed to slow the, the growth of this virus down and to flatten the curve. Now these down here, one, one fun thing to ask kids is to say, what, do you, what does it look like is happening between week one and week five? And the, the answer that they typically come up with is, well, nothing is happening. Well, we know better than that. It's something had to be happening. Otherwise, we couldn't have shot up like this to week 10. So if you hover over each of these little data points, you get an ordered pair or a, a two numbers in parentheses. The first number is the number of weeks. Second number is the number of zombies. So you can see that the weeks are going up by one, but the number of zombies is increasing faster and faster and faster at an exponential rate. So there's our scary graph, not only for zombies, but also for any infectious disease. And, and again, the current one, the COVID-19, uh, incredibly uh, similar to what we just looked at. This actually is a, a photograph from 1918 
in a makeshift hospital in Kansas. So if you are a Kansas resident, big shout out for you. This was in 1918, and, and people tend to not really remember what was going on in 1918 besides World War I, which was bad enough. But in the, at the same time, we had an influenza pandemic, actually or epidemic, a worldwide event that is estimated to have infected about one third of the entire world's population back then. Now, to be sure, the population was way less, but it's estimated that, get this, check this number out, 50 million people died from this influenza outbreak and this influenza pandemic, 50 million. Now the population back then was probably, I would say 2 billion, I should look that up, I should know that, but another great opportunity for research. So you think about the tumultuous time this had to have been, not only World War I going on, but also this pandemic, this influenza pandemic that resulted in the deaths of literally millions of people. Um, now, kids are funny because they will say things to you like, well, why didn't they just get flu shots? And I know you're probably snickering, laughing, whatever right now, but think about the kids' paradigm. Think about the world they live in. They have probably been getting flu shots since they were babies, and that's part of their life. That's part of their reality. A hundred and so, and a couple, 102, 103 years ago, that wasn't part of the reality. There were no flu shots, which again is a testimony to the effectiveness of vaccines on the survival rate of people and also the lifespan of people. So rather than just belaboring this, but again, look at the, the great opportunity to do some research on this particular epidemic or pandemic. The last thing we're going to do in this activity is we're going to do another simulation and show uh, a graph that measures and then plots this uh, phrase called virulence of this zombie virus. Virulence basically just means how easy is it to get this from one person to another. For example, chicken pox, which again, students probably never had chicken pox because they get vaccinated against chicken pox. But when I was a kid, we all got it. And chicken pox is incredibly virulent. I mean, it's not deadly. It's not a really, it's not, you know, it's not nice to have chicken pox, but it typically doesn't cause people to die. So, but it's amazingly virulent. It's very contagious. So on this next page, we're going to actually control the virulence of the zombie virus. And then we do that by looking at the bottom left-hand corner of this screen. And I can toggle, I'm just clicking on these arrows, and the virulence goes from one to 10. Okay, so we'll just run this a couple of times and we'll take a look at the difference. So I'll just go down to, to two. We'll say, we're gonna make this a virulence of two. And here's one graph, and here's another graph. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on play, and we're gonna watch what happens. And I, I Trust me, my hands are not touching the computer right now. This is running on its own. This is a simulation that is running. And you can see both sides of the screen are changing. The red boxes are filling in in greater and greater number on the left, and the graph on the right is actually plotting the data. And there it's done. Okay, so we can take a look at this graph and say, well, to get to 1, or 16,150, it took us 25, and we didn't put a unit of time here, let's just say 25 weeks, whatever. So it took us 25 weeks at a virulence of two. So I'm gonna go ahead and reset this, and this time I'm gonna crank that up to 10. So I'm gonna make this really, really virulent. Now you'll see something right away that looks different, and I'll go ahead and click play and just, you can watch this. Whereas before it took us <coughs> much longer to complete this simulation, this one's going much faster. Even, even in, in the real time thing, it's going much faster. So we're almost to the end here. So if, if I remember right, it took us 25 units of time to, to max out here, and here it only took us 20. So a great strategy with students here is to have 
uh, all of the virulence is represented. Just have e each kid do a different virulence and then compare them all with the people who are sitting around them. Now, while we were doing that, this is one of my favorite graphs. While we were doing that, another graph was being generated without us even seeing it being generated. And this is a graph that shows the number of, well, let's start with the red one, the number of zombies. So the number of zombies is increasing, 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 and then it's starting to level off. The rate of infection is decreasing because we don't have as many people to in, infect anymore. Whereas the numbers of humans that are normal still, that are not zombified, is decreasing until finally we level that off. We don't have as many people to infect, so the rate of infection is slowing down. Now, what a great opportunity, especially with this red graph here. If you're a biology teacher, we all use graphs like this in our curriculum. And I'm thinking in specifics, specifically about when we talk about ecology, we call, talk about population growth, a J-shaped population curve and that turns into kind of this S-shaped population curve. And the result of that or the cause of that are these things called limiting factors. And there is a carrying capacity of every environment for every different type of organism. Every species of organism is a different carrying capacity in the environment. That's a great way to model that and ask the kids, well, why is this leveling off? And the reason it's leveling off is we're running out of people to turn into zombies. I mean, if you think about COVID, eventually the curve was going to flatten. I mean, whether we tried to do it or not, eventually the curve would flatten. Because if it if everybody on the planet got infected with COVID, the rate of infection would start to slow down. I hope you I hope that makes sense. Because eventually the curve's gonna flatten. We just try to flatten it using means to keep people safer and to keep the hospitals from being overcrowded and so on. So this is a really cool graph too that represents the zombies and the humans. Now, if you are a math teacher or if you know a math teacher and you show them this graph, especially if they teach algebra two, they could teach a lot of content right off this graph. And one of those pieces of content they could teach is where do those two plots cross each other? And if they, if they can determine that and calculate that, that's called solving a system of equations. And that's a big, big deal in uh, second semester algebra one and, and first semester algebra two. That's a huge, huge deal. So there's some graphs that we can look at as we go through some of the the uh, growth and the, uh, the increase in the number of zombies and the decrease in the number of normal humans. And I believe that's it. That's our last page right there. And this just kind of gives some, uh, some credits. I would like to call out, here's Dr. Schlossman, Stephen Schlossman, Schlossman, that professor at Harvard Medical School. If you're like really into zombies, if you're a zombie person, he wrote, Dr. Slosman wrote this book called The Zombie Autopsies, Secret Notebooks from the Apocalypse. There's a great backstory uh, with this book that I won't share with you right now. But if you're, if you're into zombies, this is a pretty, it's a quick read. It's very entertaining. It's kind of scary and very, very cool. And, and a, kind of a spoiler alert here is Dr. Slosman actually writes about finding a cure for zombieism. And if you're a chemistry teacher, I'll tell you, it has to do with the pH of the blood, which is, which is a really, really big deal. The pH is a huge, huge deal. Hello, my name is Dana Morse, and I'm an educational technology consultant for Texas Instruments. I cover New York and Pennsylvania, working closely with schools and whatnot. So what we're going to do today on this video is one of, has become one of our most popular conference activities, one of our most popular conference sessions. And the, the session is called, or the activity is called the body of evidence. This activity, just a little background, uh, is under an umbrella of activities on the TI website called STEM, S-T-E-M, all caps. Everybody's familiar with STEM or STEAM. STEM behind Hollywood. 
Uh, the idea behind this activity was, and behind all of these STEM Behind Hollywood activities, was to bring cool ideas and cool concepts into the classroom. So we use things like zombies, we use things like forensics, we use DNA, like CSI type of things as well, and thus several other activities. But this is one that we're going to do today. It's called the Body of Evidence, and the kind of a spoiler alert background is um, a, a team of forensic scientists and law enforcement find a dead body and the, the idea is to, the task and the goal is to identify who this person is, the dead body, who that is, based on a whole bunch of evidence that we're going to work through in this activity. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and share this activity, share my screen with you. And I'll just get rid of me up here because you don't want to see me. You want to see this. And this is actually the first page in the activity. All of our activities um, are sort of like PowerPoints. They're, they're, they have a whole bunch of pages in them. And you can see at the top of my screen right here, page 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1 and there's more over here. This blue arrow tells me there's going to be more pages. And um, all of our activities, at least in the STEM Behind Hollywood genre, start with an image that is designed to get the attention of the user. And believe me, this image right here gets the attention of the user. Um, I actually spend time on this page and say, what do you see here? And most people are looking at the picture and they, they, they don't even look at the cool little three there that's in place of the E in evidence. But they say, well, that's a dead body. And there's no real evidence that that's a dead body, but it certainly looks like it could be one lying there on the ground with this STEM scene, do not cross crime scene tape. And then the subtitle of body of evidence is using clues from a decomposing body. Right there, you've got the attention of virtually every young person that you're going to ever deal with, and older person. Uh, using clues from a decomposing body to solve a missing person's mystery. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. We're going to walk through this uh, fairly quickly. I mean, we don't we have a limited amount of time. This activity in real life is much longer than the one you're going to see today. And when I say much longer, there are just a lot more pages in this activity. Um, but for the in for the sake of time and uh, because we don't want to cloud up everything with a whole bunch of pages that really aren't that important to us right now. I deleted a whole bunch of pages uh, in this activity, but none of the ones that I deleted have any bearing on the outcome or any bearing on the, uh, the coolness of this activity, if you will. So let's go ahead and start walking our way through this. This is, like I said, the intent of this cover page is to grab the attention of a student so that they want to move on. And let's move on and, and uh, take a look at what we have next. So I'm going to go to page 1.2. I'm just clicking on these tabs. And the very first page of text is page 1.2. And believe me, when once those students have seen that first page of the supposedly dead body, presumably dead body, I should say, they will read this. They will read this page 1.2. And, and teachers who had just a struggle sometimes getting kids to read things don't have a struggle getting kids to read this because they, they do read it because they want to see what's going on with that dead body. So here we have a breaking news alert. And if I'm working this activity with a bunch of teachers or with a bunch of, of students, I give them a couple of minutes to read this page. And I ask them to tell me what they what they believe from a forensics or crime solving standpoint what are three or four important pieces of information on this page and you know we can look at a bunch of them and i'll tell you what people normally do people normally look at numbers it's kind of funny how people look at that so they're like well one important piece of information is right there that the person that they've discovered is between ages 30 and 50. okay so that right there narrows down our search quite a bit, okay? We also know, or is narrow, narrowed down our, op our options quite a bit. We also know that this, this victim is male. So right there, that cuts the options in half. Going 30 to 50 cuts it down even more. And to cut it down even more, we've actually identified 
based on the time they went missing and various other pieces of evidence that we don't list here, that there are four individuals who are in play here. It could be a number of uh, only four individuals. So those are some of the things that people point out. They also say, well, the body was discovered in an open field just outside the city limits. That's all important. All of this stuff is important. Rarely, I think maybe only one time in the entire time I've ever done this activity with people, do, does anybody mention that as a very important piece of information? Not so much the time, but the date. July, at least in the United States, in the Northern Hemisphere, July is summertime. And there's a hugely important idea in all of science. And that hugely important idea is the effect of temperature on rates of reaction. Now, you being, you're probably adults, I, I doubt if this is gonna be shown to an awful lot of young people, but we're talking about a, a process here called, oops, called decomposition. We're gonna decompose this body. Decomposition is a series of chemical reactions. And reactions, chemical reactions can, to a certain point, be enhanced or suppressed by adding temperature or adding heat or taking away heat. So here we are, July 18th, and it's probably pretty hot. Okay, so we gotta keep that in mind. That's a hugely important piece of information. Where I live in South Dakota, believe me, we've had a, it's, it's been a pretty hot, dry summer where I live, hotter and drier than normal. So in July, it was pretty hot. If this said January 18th, not so much. In January in South Dakota, uh, and in the upper Midwest, it's usually not very hot. And so the, the impact of temperature is hugely important when it comes to uh, reaction rates. And in this case, that reaction, series of reactions is decomposing a body. All right, so let's go to the next page. What we do in this activity is we have the student play the role of what's called a forensic anthropologist. Now, we call out, throughout this activity, we call out several uh, pieces of the team here that are gonna be working on this case. One of them is a forensic anthropologist. Another one you see here is a forensic pathologist. Another one is law enforcement, or the police are involved, of course, in this, in this, uh, in this case. So one of the things we can sneak in on students here is, you know, there's some career opportunities that you may not have ever thought of before that could be available to you, could be open to you. And we try to call those out here. So we have the kids play the role of the forensic anthropologist here. So the, kind of the big shot of the case. We actually had in this activity, a real life board certified forensic anthropologist help us with this activity. Her name is Dr. Diane France, and she is, uh, like I said, a forensic anthropologist, lives in Colorado, and is a wonderful lady and was a tremendous help to this. She was actually a consultant for several TV shows like Bones and that type of thing. So uh, she, she actually gave us the thumbs up to release this activity because she thought it was actually very accurate and very good. Now here's our first introduction to another word that keeps kids' attention, and that is maggots. Um, everybody, I think, is familiar with what maggots are. They're a fly larva, and they tend to show up on dead stuff, whether it be, in this case, a decomposing body or a piece of meat or something like that, or even vegetables. You might see maggots crawling all over those sometimes. Hopefully, you don't see that too much, but, I'm not, you, know, but you get the idea. So maggots usually are found where there's dead stuff. So let's move on to the, the next page. So the forensic pathologist finds trauma to the head. So here's just a little bit more background information. And as I mentioned before, believe me, students read this because they are now, even after a, only a couple minutes, they are totally engaged in this thing because they wanna to try to figure out who this person is. Here's another career potential, a forensic entomologist, which is an entomologist is a bug studier. And Dr. France said she knows people who are forensic entomologists who all they do is they, they study maggots. 
which I'm not so sure that would be something I'd want to do with my life, but they do, and they're very, very valuable to solving cases. So there's another option for you to point out to your to the students. So now we have a, a conversation between the law enforcement officer and you, and you are the forensic anthropologist. And this first piece is a conversational thing that is just about the, de the different stages of decomposition. And let's take a look at those. Here they are, there, there's actually more than five, but we kind of, kind of pared this down to five major stages of decomposition from fresh, in other words, right when the, the person dies or an animal dies, and then from, to bloated, which you may have seen a roadkill or something like that on the side of the road and it gets all bloated up and, and that's one stage of decomposition. Then we have active decay. There's two stages of that. One of them has uh, maggots and the other one's really, the other one stage, the other stage of active decay really doesn't have maggots because the maggots are kind of running out of lifespan and they're running out of things to eat. And then finally we get to the dry decay and, and I think you can picture that like a mummif almost a mummified uh, body. So there's the different stages of decomposition. This is all gonna come back to us now. We're gonna, we're gonna come back and use this information later in the case. So here are our four guys that uh, we have identified as being the, the people who are still in the game. In other words, one of these four guys is our victim, is our dead body. So we have Joby and John and Cal and Cy. And these dates are the date that they were reported to have been missing. So we can see that John has been missing, and remember this is July 18th. John has been missing since May 17th, so about two months. When I say this is July 18th, from the background information that we had on that news report. Uh, so he's been gone the longest, and then Cy Walker uh, disappeared only just a little more than a week ago. And then we have Cal and Joby who are kind of in between those two things. Okay, so this is like foreshadowing. You're gonna see these guys show up again, and we're gonna try to figure out who the dead body is based on a bunch of evidence. Okay. So now you're gonna see probably the, the cool factor of uh, the TI Inspire graphing calculator. It does things that most other handheld devices, unless you have an iPad or something like that, but graphing calculators aren't supposed to do what I'm gonna show you here. And by the way, I'm showing you this obviously on a computer. This is computer software, but the calculator itself will do the exact same thing that you're gonna see me do right now with this this dead body. Here's a silhouette of a dead body. And what we're going to do here is make two choices. We're going to choose the temperature of the environment at the time. Like we're going to have every kid choose a different one actually. And then we're going to choose the level of humidity. Arid is just a word that means dry. So this would be like Arizona air and humid would be like Louisiana air. Okay. Something like that. So um, we have eight different possibilities, four temperatures and two levels of humidity. And so what I usually do is divide this up and say, let's just make sure, I say to the students, let's make sure we have all eight possibilities rec represented. So I'm just gonna do uh, one here. I'll, do, I'll click on cool and notice what happens. When I click on these buttons, the background color changes, which is pretty cool. I think that's pretty neat. So I'm gonna go cool, and I'll change that to humid, okay? And it tells me what my conditions are that I chose over here. So now we're on day zero, this person just died. He's in stage one of decomposition. And now I'm gonna click on the play button and we're gonna watch what happens to this dead body. And I'll just kind of be quiet and you can watch, here we go. So the black things are, are um, blow flies and the yellow things are maggots and that pink stuff is odor that's wafting out of the body and you can see the body is definitely changing. You can see the day count, it's like a scoreboard. So we're still in stage three, there we go to stage four and we're just gonna let this run until we get all the way completed with the decomposition. We'll know we're completed because we'll be in stage five and the day count will stop. Now I know the day count is still going here on this one, but any second now, 
the day count will stop. Now, while this is happening, let me just tell you what you'll see and what your students will see on their calculators. As they, depending on what conditions they chose, this number will be different and it will take a different amount of time. So for example, if a kid chooses hot and humid, this number right there is way less because decomposition takes place much faster at a higher temperature. If they choose cold and arid or cold and humid, this actually takes, I can't remember how many days it takes, maybe 80. So it takes a long time. So that's right there. There's a great lesson in that. Temperature matters. And as the temperature increases, so does the rate of decomposition. Okay, next page. While that was being done, while the, while the body was decomposing, the data was actually being uh, stored for us and plotted. So here we have the stages, one, two, three, four. We don't have stage five because stage five is pretty much endless. I mean, it, it, once you get to stage five, there's no stage six. So there's no number here. But here we have the numbers of days that this body spent in each of those stages. <clears throat> so in day one or stage one spent about three and a half days, stage two and so on. And then we also give them a picture of that. So we have a bar graph and in this particular bar, we can see that the stage between stage three and four lasted the longest amount of time. So again, if we would have chosen cold and arid, these yellow bars would have been much, much higher, much bigger. We would have a lot more days for each of the stages. Whereas if we would have chosen hot and humid, you barely can see these bars. There's, they go so fast and there's not a whole lot of, of height to each of those bars. So great opportunity to compare and contrast data based on variables that are used in this activity. So here's kind of a, just a generalized baseline graph where we have the blue representing arid days. So we here we have cold and arid. Here we have cool and arid and so on. And the uh, orange bars represent humid. So right here, the kid can see that, yeah, humidity does play a, a role in this. Dryness causes decomposition to happen much more slowly because that bar is higher. So have, helping your kids read these graphs I would argue is one of the most important things you can do to help a student understand science and math better is analyzing graphical representations of data, hugely important. And so we try to include as many graphs as possible in all of our activities. Okay, most of the pages, you remember a few minutes ago I said, I deleted a whole bunch of pages out of this activity. Most of the deleted pages were questions that the student is asked to answer along the way. But one of them that I actually kept in here was this. And I don't know if you noticed, but when that, that guy got done decomposing, some of his fingers were gone. And so we like to, we, you know, this is kind of gruesome, like it's really gruesome, but it's reality. This person was found out in an open field. And so a question we ask is, what do you think happened to the fingers and some of the ribs. In other words, the, the cartilage that holds the ribs to the sternum right up in this area. And this really is thought provoking to kids because a lot of them, you'd be amazed as how many of them actually say, well, they dissolved away. Well, hopefully we can correct that. I don't think fingers aren't gonna dissolve. They're not soluble. Or maybe because we talked about maggots earlier, they're like, oh, maybe the maggots ate them. That's possible. But actually what happens typically, and doc, we have Dr. France to thank for this, and she, she went over this in great detail with us when we were constructing this activity, that it is unusual for, it, it always has been in her career, unusual for her to come upon a dead body that's out in the open somewhere that still has all of its fingers and toes, or its ears or its nose, because scavengers, especially where she lives in Colorado, lots of coyotes, lots of skunks, lots of you know raccoons, badgers, whatever, they eat what they can eat and eat it quickly. So fingers are small, they're like hors d'oeuvres, so the, the scavengers gnaws those off or bites them off and then eats them. The cartilage in the ears and the nose is very soft and that's an easy meal as well. So as gruesome as that is, that's the reality of this. And uh, 
Dr. France certainly opened our eyes to some of the realities of this line of work. So here we have another uh, conversation. And uh, this is actually about maggots, uh, which doesn't seem all that pleasant, but maggots are so critical to analyzing a scene where there's a dead body. If the maggots aren't there yet, the body probably hasn't been dead very long. If the maggots are no longer there, that means they, the body is probably either in stage three or stage four or more or past that of decomposition. But if the maggots are there, and they're, they're crawling all over, kind of slithering all over the body, then the body is probably in a, a stage two of decomposition or stage three. So here's a question I also left in there because rather than kids just say, oh, maggots are gross, I don't like them, they're disgusting. Admittedly, they may be disgusting to many people, but they do serve a purpose. And we have to look beyond this dead body thing for the purpose. We have to look at what's called their niche or their role in their environment. And you think about without maggots or without the flesh eating uh, organisms and the decomposers, uh, think about the mess that would be there uh, with the bodies not decomposing or not getting broken down quickly. Okay, <clears throat> so it's time to solve the case. And this is a review of our conditions. We're going to say we know it's July 18th. We know the conditions, or we're, gonna, we're going to say the conditions are warm and humid. And when we find the body, we find the body in stage three. Okay, so we're not finding a completely decomposed body. We're not finding a, a body that's fresh. There's a lot of maggots. The skeleton is a little bit exposed, and there's a strong odor. Eventually, there's no odor in these dead bodies because there's nothing all the gases have been released from the body and there's nothing to decompose. So there's our conditions. So this is gonna look familiar now. There's our dead body. Now let's go back here and review. So now everybody, all of my students then, would now set their parameters to be the same, warm and humid. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and run this. We've got warm and humid. You're gonna see the same thing basically happen to this person's body. There's the bloat stage, and we're going to get to uh, stage three. There we go. We're going to just let this run all the way through. Because it's warm and humid, this shouldn't take as long as the one we did for practice, which was cool and arid or cool and humid. I can't remember which uh, level of humidity I chose. But here we are at about day 20, <clears throat> and already we're in stage five. So we're getting close to the end. We'll see how long this actually takes us to get all the way completed with the decomposition. Okay, there we go. So it took 27 days. I think the other one was like 54. So this took about half the time to get through the, the decomposition. Now this is also going to look familiar, but now we're going to actually use these data. Here's our data table. Now if you remember, we found the body in stage three of decomposition. So let's go over here to this little spreadsheet, this little data table, and do some quick little addition. So stage one took 1.8 days. Stage two took 2.7 days. So, so far, if my calculations are right, we are at 4.5 days. And now the body was found in stage three. So we can ignore this 6.3 because we're not going to that's irrelevant to us. But 7.2 is not irrelevant. So we are at 4.5 and 7.2, which is 11.7 days to the end of stage three. 11.7 days to the end of stage three. And we found this body in stage three. So it's somewhere between 4.5 days out and 11.7 days out. Okay, you with me? All right, let's take a look. Here's our guys, Joby, John, Cal, and Cy. Now, I just take a quick look at that, and we're looking for somebody who has been missing since, now it's July 18th. We're looking for somebody who's been missing somewhere between four and a half days prior, so like July 13th and a half, basically, to 11 some days prior, which would be July 8th or 9th. No, sorry, July 7th or 8th. 
and the kids get so excited about this, you guys. Seriously, they, they get so, and teachers, adults get really excited about this because they're using all of these clues and they're, they're using their investigative work to say, you know what, I think that poor dead body belongs to Cy Walker. I wanted to share, again, the resources from Texas Instruments. Go to education.ti.com and then look for Activities and click on STEM activities. You will find a plethora of activities from STEM behind Hollywood, STEM behind sports, STEM behind health, and STEM behind NASA. Everything that you saw on this video tonight can be done with just the software alone, but if you get back to face-to-face -face instruction and would like to borrow the TI Inspire CX handhelds, contact your local consultant or me at dmorse at ti.com and we can work with you to loan for free the TI Inspire and Vernier Probeware technology.